And we now move on to uh, questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Mr. Marchin O'Muller. Uh, question number one. Mr. Speaker, the report following the reinspection of McGabry Prison in January recognises the complex and challenging environment for prisoners and for staff. I am encouraged that it acknowledges that the prison has been stabilised and progress has been made across a range of areas, including the improvements made in safety and leadership. I welcome this. However, that progress must be built upon and continue. Significant work has been carried out to improve performance and deliver better outcomes for prisoners. A comprehensive action plan has been put in place to address the shortcomings identified and to ensure that McGabry delivers a safe, decent and secure environment for staff as well as those in custody. This plan is being robustly managed and the McGabry senior management team is continuing to focus on the key priorities and recommendations to address the concerns raised and ensure that improvement continues. I do not underestimate the challenges which remain, but having independent verification that progress has been made should give staff, prisoners, their families and the wider community confidence that McGabry is moving in the right direction. It's appropriate for uh, to wish the Minister well on his last uh, question time, but your legacy will depend on how you answer the next uh, question, the supplementary. Um, is, it, is it the case then, based on that answer, Minister, that the Ancien Regime, which you can translate as Old Guard, that the Old Guard at Macabre, uh, with its resistance to change, is now on the back foot or is now a thing of the past? Well, I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, that I would quite recognise the interpretation that Mr. Moylier has put on things. What I can confirm is the strong recognition which came from Sijini. Um, both in the report and in the subsequent words of Mr. Brendan McGuigan uh, in his press conference and when he appeared before the Justice Committee, that he has confidence in the leadership team in McGabry. Whilst he identified that progress was fragile, he made it clear that he believed significant progress had been made and he had confidence that that would continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I too wish uh, the, uh, the Minister well in the future? Uh, could the Minister outline how the glaring deficits in mental health support for prisoners is going to be rectified, a matter highlighted by the CGI report. And touching upon the earlier question, are you not concerned that after years of reform and oversight, there does seem, still seem to be a stream within the prison service that sees the role of prison to be first and last and only punishment of the prisoner? Well, I thank Mr. Atwood for his good wishes as well. I hope not every member is going to stand up and going to say that, Mr. Speaker, to keep me busy. Um, clearly, there is an issue that there are difficulties for some members of the prison service in adjusting to a different set of arrangements. That's why we had the voluntary exit scheme, and we allowed people who had served in difficult times to leave with dignity, but not all who were eligible to leave have left. All I can say is what I see in terms of my contact with the leadership team in McGabry, the leadership team in prison headquarters, and indeed from visiting McGabry in engagement with individuals, is that there is a change in atmosphere, but it has not changed as far or as fast as we would hope, and that will be ongoing work for my successor. Mr. Danny Kent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bearing in mind, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the comments made in the original report, which found, and I quote, many staff continued to adhere to a view that prisoners were to be feared. Can I ask the Minister whether he agrees that following the recent attempted murder of a prison officer in East Belfast, does that demonstrate that such fears are indeed well founded by prison officers and staff? Well, there is certainly a point to what Mr Kennedy says, Mr Speaker. But there is a difference between the issue of the threat which is posed to prison officers as to police officers in their private lives and the issues within the prison where there is less of a direct threat than there is sometimes perhaps perceived to be on the streets outside. I do think we see uh, situations improving significantly, for example, in greater supervision of communal areas and ensuring that that is carried out in a way which provides suitable protection for prisoners as well as prison staff. But I can only go on the basis of the report which is given to me by those who carried out the inspection. And certainly the, the contrast between the references in May when the Sijini team and their colleagues left 
uh, with a palpable sense of despair, to use the precise quotation, and in January they left with a sense of hope is an indication of good progress being made. And I call Mr William Humphrey. Mr Speaker, question number two. The Northern Ireland Prison Service is committed to ensure that as an organisation it reflects the community it serves. In launching the most recent recruitment campaign, Prison Service sought to encourage applicants from all sections of the community. Information about the vacancies was broadcast on local radio and the advertisement was widely published in newspapers and journals whose readership gives a representative spread. The Prison Service also asked all councils and a range of community representatives to advise those with whom they have contact of the employment opportunity. A number of outreach measures have been undertaken to encourage applications from members of underrepresented sections of the community and to promote a positive image of the prison service. Links have been developed with schools in Northern Ireland through careers officers and information on career opportunities in NIPS has been presented under the Northern Ireland Schools and College Association Experience of Work programme. Presentations have also been delivered to a number of schools. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I also condemn the evil attack on the prison officer in East Belfast last week and wish him a speedy recovery and our thoughts with his, his family and colleagues at this time. I welcome the measures which the Minister has outlined here today, but difficult though it may be to recruit from the communities that I have addressed in my uh, question and the Minister responded to in his answers. What more can be done to get recruits from, the, from areas such as North Belfast that I represent? These people, these evil people, must never be allowed to win and they cannot be seen to win, and all that can be done to attract uh, representatives from across the community must be done by the Northern Ireland Prison Service to ensure that the prison service is indeed reflective of society. Well, can I thank Mr Humphrey for his condemnation of the attack on Friday a week ago. Uh, I met the prison officer's family that day. I have since had the opportunity to meet him. I am pleased to say that he is making a reasonable recovery from his injuries but that attack must be condemned and I welcome the condemnation which I know would come from any part of this House. One does need to be careful in terms of how we talk about recruitment to ensure that we don't get away from the basic principle of recruitment on merit. The key issue is to ensure that people are encouraged to apply from every part of the community and that is what I believe has been carried out. Certainly in, in terms of recent recruitments, for example, to the prisoner escort custody service to PECS, uh, and to some of the uh, opportunities which have been presented over the last year or so, we have seen a more representative group uh, applying for postings within the prison service, but it is not yet fully representative, and that is work which has to continue. Mr. Damon McCart. From Yoga to Kevin Cooler and Gwen Buigas, Les and and Fragerson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. In, in relation to the the reasons for the exit scheme and indeed the recruiting procedures came from the ANOR's recommendation. Would the Minister agree that it is vital that recruitment continues to ensure that we do uh, tackle the customers and practices which need replenished and refreshed? Well, yes, I certainly agree with Mr McCartney that recruitment has to be continued. Members will be aware, at least if they have been following things in the Justice Committee, that there are a number of vacancies currently being addressed by recruitment and indeed uh, there was a, um, a recent passing out parade from the college, as now is within Hyde Bank Wood, uh, on last Friday, of another class graduating for the escort service. So there is ongoing work in that respect, but I accept that there are issues which tie in with things like overtime, the flexibility that, prepare, that provides, as opposed to the issue of the numbers of mainstream staff in post. And those are continuing issues as we deal with the difficult budget situation that NIPS, as indeed the whole of the Justice Department has. Call Mr. Daniel uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his uh, answers so far. I'm sure the Minister will agree that it's very important that the prison service reflects the entire community and its workforce. Uh, can I ask the Minister what percentage of Catholic and female recruits, what, what the percentage is? Uh, I can't give the exact figures at this stage, I don't think, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, but certainly the, the last figures I saw uh, were. Uh, at the point in June of 2012, 80% uh, of staff were seen as Protestant and 79% uh, were male. There has been a significant turnaround, but I, I can't give the most recent recruitments, but in, um, by March of 2016, 
the overall numbers who were Protestant was simply at 78%, so still a very high proportion, although the numbers of recruits has changed that slightly. And uh, at that stage, the numbers of males was down to 72% from 79%. So modest progress, certainly the intakes have been significantly more representative, but overall, given the limited numbers who've been recruited, it hasn't made a huge difference. Commissar Ross Hussey. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Uh, I too would like to condemn those who terrorised uh, the prison officer recently, and, and terrorists terrorise in an effort to discourage people from joining the prison service or the police service for that matter. How many posts will be available to be applied for in the coming year in relation to prison officers? I don't that have that information at this stage, Mr. Speaker, for the basis we don't know how many retirements there will be, how many resignations there will be, um, or indeed the precise details of how the budget will, will apply across. But there is active recruitment proceeding. Uh, if I am in a position to give any more detail, uh, I will write to Mr. Hussey with the full details. I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Question three, Mr. Speaker. The Justice No. 2 Bill currently before the House will increase the maximum prison sentence for animal cruelty cases heard in the Crown Court from two years to five years. The maximum sentence in the Magistrates' Courts for certain animal cruelty offences will also increase from six months to 12 months, and the maximum fine will increase from £5,000 to £20,000. Increasing the maximum penalties available will act as a significant deterrent and sends out a strong message that animal cruelty will not be tolerated in our society. Northern Ireland will have the toughest penalties for animal cruelty of any region of these islands. Well, Mr. Hedian, in for... Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Minister, um, how can you guarantee that these penalties will be used to the maximum whenever someone is uh, found guilty for committing such a crime? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, members will be aware that the Minister can't do anything to guarantee how sentences will, will, sentences will be used. The decision in any individual case will be the decision for the judge, but by a significant increase in the maximum penalty, it is sending out a clear message from this Assembly as the legislative body to those who pronounce sentences of the expectation of a significant increase in sentences given. John Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his answer, which is very welcome. Would the Minister agree with me that there is an enormous task to be undertaken? and educating those people who still believe that it's okay uh, to cause cruelty to animals, whether they're domestic or wild animals. Would he agree with me that we should get on with the task of making it clear in the widest possible way that cruelty to animals wherever is evil, it's wrong? I certainly agree with Mr. Dallet that there is an enormous task in dealing with the small number of people in this society who believe that such behaviour is acceptable. I think the overwhelming public response to the proposals to enhance sentences shows where the vast majority of our people are. Uh, I'm not sure how much role the Department of Justice has in educating people except in so far as by enhancing these sentences in the work being done between justice and agriculture, we are sending out a clear message which I believe will be well publicised through social media and the press and uh, broadcast media. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alistair thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Given the case of Cody the dog near Moira and the utterly disgusting attack on Tigger the cat in Hillsborough last week, would the Minister agree with me that sentences must be handed out by the courts that reflect public revulsion at the people who commit these crimes? Well, I don't think Mr. Patterson was in the chamber earlier when I'm debating the, the current bill. Mr. Speaker, this was touched on by a number of members. Um, it is, of course, right, of course, right that we, as the legislature, should send out a message by enhancing the sentences. But I would need to be very careful in suggesting that I would tell any judge the precise sentence which should be awarded in any particular case. I call Ms. Joanne Dobbs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, though I have written to and corresponded with the Finance Minister, I have not spoken directly to him or his officials on any particular proposal. 
I have always been and I remain fully supportive of a centrally driven and centrally funded solution. This is a matter for the Department of Finance and Personnel, not the Department of Justice, as it affects staff across a number of departments and other bodies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. He will be aware that I have raised this issue on quite a number of occasions with him, yet those affected are still waiting. I appreciate that this issue affects staff in other departments. However, can the Minister outline what actions he has taken on behalf of those staff members in his department who still contact all of us on this issue? Well, as I have said, Mr. Speaker, I have uh, corresponded with the Finance Minister, uh, but fundamentally the issue concerned is an issue for the Department of Finance and Personnel as an issue of civil service pay in general. There are staff in the Department of Justice who are affected. There are also staff probably by now in each of the other 11 departments which are affected as well. And only the Department of Finance and Personnel can set the arrangements. Uh, I have certainly responded to the draft executive paper the Finance Minister circulated on the 19th of February, but that paper has not yet been considered by the executive. Can I call Mr. Jim what does the Minister think it says to those staff that for five years now, probably, this issue has been talked about but not acted upon and passed from one department to another? Yes, the primary responsibility no doubt does lie with DFP, but can the Minister update us as to whether the executive of which he's a member has yet discussed and agreed a paper which the Finance Minister claims has been placed before them? Mr Speaker, I thought I'd just made it clear to Mrs Dobson that the executive has not discussed that. And the issue has not been passed from one department to the other. The issue is for DFP and DFP has prepared draft papers which have not yet been discussed by the executive. Thank you. And I call Mr Gordon Dobb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question five, please. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'll take questions five and six together. This Act is not a replacement for the Misuse of Drugs Act. It adds another means on top of existing legislation of combating the sale and distribution of so-called legal highs. These substances frequently contain completely new chemical compounds with unknown dangerous properties, and they can and do cause serious harm and even death. It is often the case that those experimenting with recreational drugs are misled into thinking such substances are safe. By making any psychoactive substance automatically illegal, other than the small number of exemptions such as alcohol, nicotine and caffeine, the new legislation will make it very difficult indeed for the so-called head shops to continue to apply their harmful trade. The legislation will considerably enhance the enforcement powers available against those intent on supplying these harmful substances right across the UK. The Act focuses on possession with the intent to supply and doesn't create an offence of simple possession except within a custodial institution. In terms of the impact of the Act on the justice system, the main effect will be on the ability of the police to move more quickly and effectively against head shops and other dealers of psychoactive substances. Following royal assent on the 28th of January, my department and organisations across the criminal justice system have continued to prepare for the coming into force of the Act on the 6th of April. Mr. Dunn for sub. I and thank the Minister for his answers. Following on from the experience of similar legislation in the Irish Republic, can the Minister assure us that the new legislation will be effective and that the police and other agencies, including councils, will have the necessary resources to carry out enforcement? The main issue being that the police now have to scientifically prove that a substance is psychoactive. Well, yes, although the, um, in the first instance, the, the issue is ensuring that anything which might be psychoactive uh, can be dealt with. I can't guarantee the resources which will be provided to local councils, Mr Speaker. I can tell the House about a recent visit I paid to Queen's University to see work being done between Queen's and Forensic Science, uh, where, uh, as, a res as part of a particular project, uh, it was possible to identify something like 75% of psychoactive substances 
on a relatively simple uh, laser imaging test, the precise details of the physics and chemistry being a bit beyond me. But what was clear is it was saving significantly on the resources, meaning that only one sample in four was going to be, need to be subjected to the full resources of forensic science to deal with. I think that's an example of positive partnership. I'm delighted that that was funded by the Assets Recovery Community Scheme, and I think it's the kind of good work which is helping keep Northern Ireland at the forefront against NPSs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister if he agrees that the Psychoactive Substances Act is a clear demonstration that we will not allow the lives of people in our community to be put at risk by these dangerous and at times fatal psychoactive substances, and that those who seek to distribute them will and can expect to be brought to justice? Well, I welcome the question. I, I think, as was highlighted by Mr. Don, this is an issue where UK legislation has learnt from the Irish experience, not always the way in which legislation is made in these islands. It's been as a result of good cooperation across a number of agencies, um, including uh, involvement which the DOJ had in pressing the Home Office to learn the Irish lessons. And between ourselves, the Scots, and the Home Office, I think we have now got good legislation. Clearly, there will be a lot to do to ensure that it is made fully operational, but I believe that it's very beneficial that the Home Office listened to the experience which we were highlighting, became aware of the, uh, the alternative ways of addressing it, and I think a combination of good policy work, of good scientific advances, is going to help the fight against these dreadful substances. Can the Minister detail the number of groups and organisations who are currently receiving funding to tackle these problems of these substances? Well, I thank Mr Lynch for the question. Mr Speaker, the key issue, as I say, is the funding for the scientific work being done by Queen's. I know that there are a number of cases uh, where PCSPs are, are working. Indeed, we had good examples pioneering work almost for the UK as a whole from Belfast City Council Environmental Health Department. So there will be a number of different bodies that would be carrying out that kind of work. But the key issue is to get a joined up approach and to ensure that people work together. And clearly in terms of some of the work which is being done by PCSPs in action plans looking at drug problems, the issue of NPSs is featuring in quite a few of them. Could I ask the Minister, uh, could the Minister agree that uh, the, the need to move very efficiently and effectively to ban such harmful uh, substances is actually very important indeed? Well, yes, I, pre I appreciate the point that's being made, but the, the serious issue is that previously individual substances had to be banned effectively by name or by chemical formula. We're now in the position that the ban is absolute if there can be a psychoactive effect, um, unless it is you know, until a substance is proven to not have a psychoactive effect, it is illegal unless it falls within this small list of specified substances, which I highlighted earlier, including uh, nicotine, alcohol, uh, and caffeine, which is perhaps a lesson to those of us who had an extra cup of coffee over lunchtime. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister. On the 1st of March, I hosted an event to mark the end of the formal prison reform programme. With 90% of the recommendations signed off, we have seen significant progress, and the prison system today in Northern Ireland is very different to the one that I inherited on devolution in April of 2010. For too long, the challenge of prison reform in Northern Ireland was kept by direct rule ministers in the too difficult draw, with prisons focused on the task of containment rather than rehabilitation. Devolution gave me the opportunity to address this issue head on, and with the PRT report as the catalyst, we were able to make rehabilitation and transformational change the primary focus of our prison system. However, prison reform is not complete. We've merely come to the end of the first phase. The job over the next 10 years and beyond is to embed this change and deliver the end-to-end -end transformational change envisaged by the prison review team in 2011. Thank the Minister for his response and indeed would congratulate the Minister on implementing so many of the uh, reforms. Um, uh, and could I ask if the end of phase one uh, has now been uh, implemented, can the Minister advise the Assembly what we can expect from phase two as we go forward? Thank you. Andrea, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I'm not quite sure I would describe it as phase two, as Mr McCarthy says, Mr Speaker, but certainly in the conclusion of the work of the Prison Review Oversight Group, uh, there were five key strategic themes on which the prison service will focus to ensure that that reform is embedded. The first, leadership, recognising the importance of building a strong and effective leadership, including in particular a homegrown leadership. The second, purposeful activity, where we've seen progress made around learning and skills, particularly in Hyde Bank, but much more remains to be done. Equality and diversity, to ensure both a better outcome for prisoners and the point we were talking of earlier, a workforce that better represents our society. A fit for purpose prison estate with 21st century accommodation central to all of our plans and a partnership with healthcare, recognizing the strong relationships with healthcare colleagues working to a common goal are vital to ensure that we make progress in the prisons. Does the minister agree that uh, progression and regression uh, is easily identified by any critical read out of Anne Power's uh, prison reform review? Well, I certainly would agree with Mr Milne that not all involved in prisons are seeking to move at the same pace or in the same direction. But I do think, as I said earlier, that we have seen significant improvements recently. Uh, the fact that we've signed off on 90% of the recommendations of the prison reform programme are clear indications of positive work being done. But of course, some of it will involve partnership elsewhere around learning and skills around healthcare. A lot of it will involve the provision of capital funding for the Department of Finance and Personnel, as well as the work which needs to be done within the prison service itself and within the DOJ. So there will be a considerable amount to be done, but I am confident that we are moving in the right direction. And call Mr. Alden again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I welcome the, the uh, significant progress that's been made in prison reform. That, that, that's very, very important. It was long neglected. But would the uh, minister consider inviting Anne Ors uh, back to Northern Ireland just to review what, uh, uh, just to review what, what in fact has been achieved, uh, to measure it against her original recommendations? Would that be welcome? Well, Mr. Speaker, it is certainly an interesting idea in the sense that the PRT was put together to produce recommendations and the issue of how those recommendations were handled was left to the oversight group with specific involvement uh, from Sajini from RQIA. I'm not sure how precisely relevant bringing back the reform team or even bringing in individually Anors herself would be the appropriate way to move forward. Um, she does seem to be fairly busy with some duties she now has in policing across the water, but I certainly think it's an issue which perhaps um, in another year or two's time it might be something for my successor to think about. Mr Paul Given, quick sub. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When the Minister says uh, reform, including to better represent the community in terms of the workforce, what does he mean? I mean, just the same as we mean in the context of, for example, the reforms we've seen around the police service in recent years, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the workforce in prisons is broadly representative of the community outside. And it is clear that although, as I indicated earlier, before I think Mr. Given was in the chamber, that there has been uh, improvement in terms of the representative nature of those who've been recruited recently, the overall balance of the workforce in prisons is not as good as we would wish it to be. That said, we do have to acknowledge the challenges which are presented by the threat which is still imposed from terrorism outside, which make it particularly difficult for some people to apply to join the prison service. And that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions, and it comes to Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Continuing on the, the line of questioning in terms of prisons, uh, and I should say that I think uh, whatever religious religion you are, you've properly represented uh, our community whenever you've been a prison officer, irrespective of whether you're Protestant or Catholic, and that shouldn't come into it. Uh, could I ask the Minister for an update as to where the uh, terrorist threat currently exists in respect of prison officers? Well, just to address Mr Given's first point, um, in no way would I, was I suggesting that an individual officer cannot be a fit officer, whatever their background is, but the overall numbers uh, are not as representative of the community as we would wish them to be. In terms of the issue of threat, uh, the threat to prison officers as to police officers stands at severe, as it has 
since the point of devolution, and we witnessed Friday a week ago on the streets of Belfast just how significant that threat is. For a supplement. In light of the ongoing severe terrorist threat against prison officers, does the Minister regret entering into what was heralded as the August Agreement with the Republican prisoners off Row House, given that it has failed and the terrorist activities targeted towards those prison officers has continued day after day, year after year, and he entered into an appeasement policy with them back at that August time? Well, since I didn't enter into an appeasement policy, Mr Speaker, no, I don't regret it. There was an honest and genuine attempt to reduce the tensions which existed in Row House. It was made absolutely clear that progress on the part of making different arrangements for prisoners would be dependent upon threats ending, whether threats were in the face to officers on the landings or whether they were in social media, and that has not been the case and there has been no movement in the direction which has been alleged by some people to allow prisoners to run the house. The prison service runs Row House as every other part of McGabry Prison. Uh, could the Minister give us an update on the recruitment and appointment of a senior cor coroner? And could he give us some degree of certainty when he expects that person to be in place? Well, members will be aware, of course, that there are a number of issues relating to uh, coroner's service uh, which are uh, currently underway, um, in particular the fact that there is a High Court judge assigned to hear one of the early inquests. There is a County Court judge as well. So it is not just an issue of a senior coroner on the traditional pattern. It is a matter of the significant strengthening of the coroner's service by the movement in of other more senior judges to take on the more difficult cases, which I believe should give us all confidence. Um, I wonder, could the Minister tell us, does he believe that the coroner's office has sufficient resources to deal with all the outstanding legacy cases at the moment? Um, I well, I thank Mr Sheehan for that point. Um, I have made it fairly clear on a number of occasions publicly and on every occasion I think that I have met the Secretary of State since November last year, that the coroner's service requires a significant increase in resources to carry out its work in a way uh, that would, would provide a speedy resolution of the number of legacy inquests which are resting. Uh, members will be well aware of the work which has been done by the Lord Chief Justice to ensure that that, uh, that work uh, is done as efficiently as possible since he assumed the presidency of the court. There has been a lot of engagement around that but it's absolutely clear that the money for that uh, has to be the money which was offered by the Prime Minister over a year ago, which we have not yet seen forthcoming. And I will continue to make that case to the Executive, to the Northern Ireland Office, and I hope ultimately through them to the Treasury. Question number three has been withdrawn within the, uh, the appropriate protocols, so I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can the Justice Minister, given that this is his last question time, um, maybe give us an occasion where he hasn't passed the buck over to some other department um, because the, the answer doesn't come in under his department, and maybe um, on this occasion tell us how many times there, there have been questions where he could have answered that he didn't? The answer to the latter, Mr Speaker, is zero. If people... If people will ask me questions about matters which are either operational responsibilities for the police or the PPS or other responsibilities of other departments, I won't answer them. Um, Mr. McRae for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was maybe not surprised with the minister's answer, but um, like, sh surely, given you know that he has announced that he won't um, take on the, the job of justice minister after the. Um, election. That's of course um, depends on the electorate, of course. But nonetheless, um, surely he'll have to accept that there have been questions whether it may not have come in under his direct responsibility that he could have answered in respect of whether it was in placing matters or in other um, aspects within the justice instead of passing the buck. Surely he has to accept that there have been occasions that he's done that, and will he at least um, admit to, to that and indeed maybe answer some that he has passed the buck off in the past? 
really a matter Mr. for the Minister if you want to address that or not. Well, I mean, Mr. Speaker, given that Mr. McRae started up by saying the decision on whether or not it was Justice Minister was one for the electorate, actually it's not, it's one for me. Whether I am an MLA is an issue for the good people of South Antrim. Whether I'm Justice Minister, I've made it fairly clear. Um, the rest of his answer, or the rest of his question, merited about the same kind of answer as what I've just given to the first bit. I beg. <clears throat> Earlier today, uh, the Minister was answering a question about the Psychoactive Substances Act 2016, which has now got royal assent. Um, and my East Antrim constituency suffered from a retail operation selling bath salts and plant food. So my question to the Minister is, with that new legislation, is he aware if the, the uh, PSNI have, as of yet, utilised that legislation to shut uh, such uh, uh, retail operations? I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, um, I can answer that one even though it's actually an operational issue for the police on, on the simple basis that the legislation comes into force on the 6th of April this year, so I can assure all members that the PSNI have not made use of it, though I can, of course, report, as I've done previously, that the PSNI and environmental health officers have made good use of existing consumer safety legislation previously. Thanks for the I uh, um, thank the Minister for that information, uh, but I am aware that certainly in, in Larne that uh, young people who had uh, congregated uh, buying such, such items were involved in, in shoplifting, etc., to fund the exercise, often coming in to Larne from other locations using public transport. So my question to the Minister uh, is a little bit wider in terms of Hyde Bank where young people who may have become addicted to such drugs ultimately entered the criminal justice system. And can the Minister uh, assure me what level of testing goes on there to ensure that uh, such drugs are not still entering the criminal, uh, sorry, entering Hyde Bank and adversely affecting the behaviour and mental health and well-being of many of our young people there? Well, Mr Speaker, that's not just a question relating to NPSs. That is an issue relating to the way in which prisons deal uh, with drug threats in all circumstances. And there is a rigorous program of both drug testing of individuals in prisons, uh, particularly if anybody has been out on home leave, of searching uh, of as appropriate visitors and prisoners coming in and leaving. All of those are done in order to seek to reduce the drug problem. But there is no doubt there is a widespread drug problem in this society, and prisons are not immune from that. All prisons can do is seek by the use of various technology of indicator dogs and by searching to ensure that they, they prevent substances coming in and then by ensuring searching is carried out in a way which deals with them if substances are actually on the premises. Mr McCausland is not in this place, although I should say that he did contact us outside the approved uh, time frame uh, to attempt to get it withdrawn. So I move on to Mr Danny Kennedy. Mr. Speaker, conscious that the, the Minister is uh, approaching the end of his tenure as uh, Justice Minister, would, uh, would the Minister reconsider the case of my constituent, uh, Mr. Colin Wharton, and his long standing campaign to finally clear his name? I fully appreciate the number of representations which have been made, not least by Mr. Kennedy, uh, about Mr. Wharton and the manner in which he stood trial and was not convicted of a serious offence some years ago, and the comparison which is made between others who were wrongfully convicted and then received compensation for serving subsequent sentences. But it is not an issue which I believe I can address. It has been through all the appeal mechanisms that has been referred through the appropriate ways in which legal cases can be dealt with, and I regret that I do not think there is anything I can do to assist Mr Wharton. The Minister for his, uh, for his re response, but can the Minister outline any possible options uh, open to Mr Wharton uh, in pursuit of his, his very justified campaign for justice? Well, I appreciate Mr Kennedy's use of the term for a justified campaign. I think we can all have sympathy for Mr Wharton, but in fact he is in no different a position from many another person who was charged and then found not guilty. There is no provision under the law of any part of the United Kingdom for compensation payments 
in those circumstances. And he has, as far as I can see, exhausted all potential legal remedies to deal with it. So whilst one can, at a human level, have great sympathy for Mrs. Mr Wharton, I, and his case has been well made, I do not believe that there is any further route which can be adopted. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister, um, you've made reference to um, the Justice Department that you inherited at the point of direct rule, and here we are quite a number of years on in respect of that. Not only have you not bucked past in terms of very difficult decisions, but you have driven the Department of Justice forward, yeah. and we now have a faster and a fairer justice system for everyone. Minister, could you highlight for the House what you consider to be some of the achievements that you have had during your time in office? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure, Mr Speaker, it would take me far longer than the two minutes you would allow to, uh, to list all the achievements. But I do think the very significant reforms to the prison system, which have been underway for some time, the significant achievements which were announced around youth justice, following on from the youth justice review in my earlier statement today, um, dare I say it, dealing in a reasonably equitable way with the difficult issue of funding legal aid are all issues which were not exactly easy, for which I believe we have seen significant improvements. And I do think a number of the measures in the last act and in the, uh, in the bill, which I trust will become an act uh, in a few minutes, plus royal assent time, Mr. Speaker, will also continue to make matters much better for this community. Thank you. And I call Mr. Dixon first. Thank you, uh, Principal Member Speaker. Um, Minister, would you also agree with me that in addition to the, those issues which you've highlighted as success since, the since, since you took office from the point of direct rule, that there have been some very dark days in the role in which you've played. And to deal with police officers' families, prison officers' families who have lost lives, who have lost limbs, who have been injured, and many others who perhaps are not known to us but are known to you. Um, Minister, would you uh, like to comment to the House on those aspects of the difficulties of being Justice Minister in Northern Ireland today, 18 years on from the Good Friday Agreement? Well, certainly, Mr Speaker, we should uh, certainly recognise the very significant progress that has been made since Good Friday. Uh, we should also recognise what I believe has been progress made in the Department, which was left as too difficult in 1998 and only saw devolution in 2010. But in my time as Minister, I have attended the funeral of David Black, a murdered prison officer. I have attended the funeral of Ronan Kerr, a murdered police officer, as well as others who have died in the course of duty, and two members of Angada Shikona who were murdered by terrorists operating on a cross-border basis. So we should fully acknowledge that there is a significant problem remaining with a small number of those who have not accepted that this society has moved on and we should ensure that we provide support to those who are leading the fight to ensure that we become a normal society, most particularly those who wear police and prison uniforms. Mr. Alban McGuinness, and we may not have time for a supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I just ask, in relation to prison reform, Monica McWilliams and indeed Patricia Gordon both said at the Justice Committee that one of the problems about retaining staff, new staff, prison staff, uh, was the fact that wages uh, were too low. Uh, would the Minister indicate to the House that he is prepared to review those wages so as to attract and retain uh, people? in the prison service. I think there is something particularly pleasant, Mr Speaker, that the last question I get at Justice Minister's question time uh, comes from one who has been a member of the committee since the very beginning and played a very significant part in its role. And it's good to not be discussing legal aid with him. <laughs> I, uh, I, I take the point that he has made around the issue of pay rates for new staff in the prison service. Uh, certainly, that has already been looked at and will, be, will continue to be looked at as we look at the issues of retention and recruitment. Um, and I have no doubt that my successor will have some decisions to take on that in the next year or so. And that concludes your final session on question time. Uh, we now move on to...